everybody and welcome to our discussion on Medicare bad debt reimbursement. In this video we are going to discuss a few of the issues that come up during a Medicare bad debt audit, some things that providers should consider when they're filling out their cost report and when they're submitting documentation to support their bad debts in order to allow for a smoother audit and review and eventual acceptance of those bad debts. So first off, let's look at the underlying principle behind Medicare bad debt reimbursement. Medicare reimburses providers for a share of the unpaid coinsurance and deductible amounts for services. And what we're basically saying here is that a patient is responsible for the coinsurance and deductible amount, but if for whatever reason that patient is unable to or unwilling to pay, after reasonable collection effort, Medicare will reimburse providers for a share of that uncompensated portion. So the underlying regulations and policy can be found at 42 CFR 41389 for the regulations and CMS Publication 15-1 Chapter 3 for the policy. And these regulations and policies detail the requirements that must be met for reimbursement. And this really sets the stage for what we're going to be talking about during this video. The first thing I want to mention here is that I said Medicare pays for a share of the bad debts. Currently, that share is set at 65%. So what that means is there's a 35% reduction in the amount that you will receive. Now, keep in mind, this is the coinsurance and deductible portion that is being paid. It's not necessarily a cost amount, so this percentage is partially intended to reduce that down to perhaps a cost approximation. This reduction has fluctuated over the years due to changes in legislation, but it's been sitting at 65% for quite a few years now. Now, one thing to note here, providers generally have an incentive to try to collect from the patient, which would give them the 100% payment rather than relying on the Medicare program to reimburse the bad debt portion. So again, if they collect from the patient, they get their 100%, assuming the patient pays everything they're required to. And the Medicare program, if they have to go to the Medicare program to get this bad debt reimbursement, it will be locked in at 65%. So now let's talk about the accounting concepts behind bad debt. So the concept of bad debt arises, again, when we have a service that's been provided where payment was supposed to be made in the future and it was not for one reason or the other. So when we provide service to a patient, accounts receivable is set up for a future expected payment. Medicare will make their payment which would include, for the hospital, it would be including the DRG, the Diagnostic Related Group Payment, basically the federal payments. And this, of course, depends on the provider type. You could have a skilled nursing facility. You could have rehab units, just a variety of different provider types. And DRG, I'm just throwing that out as the general example of a hospital reimbursement. But the point is, this is the standard Medicare payment, the prospective payment, and the patient would be liable for the Medicare coinsurance and deductibles, whatever has been determined to be their amount. So that's what we're going to see with the accounts receivable, how everything was set up. Now, there is a difference in GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, the financial accounting standards versus Medicare. There's a difference in the treatment for this unreimbursed portion. So under GAAP, financial accounting requires that we match revenues and expenses. So what this basically means is whatever period we're recording the sale in, in this case, the revenue generated from the provision of services, that's the same period we should be reporting the bad debt expense, at least an estimate of those bad debt expense amounts. Now under GAAP, What's known as the direct write-off method is not allowed. The direct write-off method is basically where we will not record a bad debt expense until we know exactly which patient did not pay and in what amount they did not pay. The problem with that situation is that we're generally talking about 
a determination that's made usually 120 days or more into the future. And in most cases, or certainly in a, a good share of the cases, that bad debt expense recognition would take place in the next year, whereas the revenue was reported this year. So that would violate the matching principle of accounting. So instead, GAAP requires the use of an allowance method, and this method basically estimates the bad debt. So at that time, we don't know who specifically won't pay, which patient will not pay the amount. We just have an estimate of the amount that will be unpaid based on past historical results. So GAAP requires this allowance method, in which case we do not know which patient specifically will not pay. We just have an estimated amount in, o in total. So the GAAP accounting concepts, we have two separate entries going on here. First, we have the bad debt expense recognition entry, and in this case, it's an estimate in the same period of service. So what will happen is we would debit the bad debt expense to match it in the same period as the underlying revenue, and the credit cannot go to a particular customer's accounts receivable because, again, at that time, we do not know which customer specifically will not pay. So a contra asset account known as the allowance for bad debts it has a variety of other names but the allowance for bad debts the provision for bad debts that account is credited to set up a fund to handle bad debt write-offs in the future so we're crediting this account on the balance sheet this account is going to offset the overall amount of accounts receivables but not one specific patient because, again, we do not know which patient will not pay. So that's the bad debt expense recognition. The bad debt write-off, which is for Medicare purposes what we're most concerned with, this is the actual amount and the actual patient that is not paying, and we're writing this off potentially several months after the service. So in this situation under this allowance method of GAAP, we would have to debit that allowance account that we previously set up. This reduces that fund because we're using this up to account for a, a patient that is not paying. And finally, we can credit this particular account's receivable for this customer because we know they have not paid us. Now, the problem under Medicare the reality under Medicare is that that allowance method is not allowed. So even though that's required under GAAP, it's not allowed for Medicare purposes. Instead, you must use the direct write-off method. You must know that a particular patient is not likely to pay at that point. So Medicare, because we're reimbursing this separate from your normal expense recognition, there's no concern with the matching or the expense cost recognition. Again, bad debts are not reimbursed as costs under Medicare. They're paid through a separate pass-through payment. That terminology, that pass-through, basically implies that the payment is passing through the traditional payment methodology. In other words, it's passing through the normal DRG reimbursement or whatever federal reimbursement you're normally receiving for the most of the services. It's passing through that, and it's getting paid in a special way. So that's where that term comes from. Again, just to summarize, for Medicare purposes, you must wait until a specific patient account and a specific amount is written off before Medicare reimbursement will be made. And at that point, it will be the entire remaining balance. So that's the other thing. An account can only be written off once. You can't have partial write-offs of an account year after year after year. If it's the same patient, same dates of service, the account must be written off at one time to avoid duplication year after year. So let's review the regulations and the policy in more detail. Here we have the regulations at 42 CFR 413.89. And there are four key regulations that show the criteria for allowable, allowable bad debt. 
First of all was the bad debt related to unpaid Medicare coinsurance and deductibles for covered services. So we'll dig into that a little bit later. We're going to dig into all four of these a little bit later, but I just wanted to summarize them up front. Number two, were reasonable collection efforts made? That's a big one. There's a lot that goes into that. Number three, was the bad debt actually collect uncollectible at the time that it was written off, claimed as worthless? And number four, does sound business judgment establish that there was no likelihood of recovery in the future? Now, I do want to point out with number four, it's not a guarantee. We're not saying is there absolutely no chance at all of recovery in the future. We're saying the sound business judgment established that there was no likelihood of recovery. Continuing on in the regulations, we get to subsection F, and this deals with the timing of when to report bad debts. So it's the charging of bad debts and bad debt recoveries. I've separated this into two sections here. The first is the write-off. The second is the recovery. So the first section says the amounts uncollectible from specific beneficiaries are to be charged off as bad debts in the accounting period in which the accounts are deemed to be worthless. That's the phrase that's used here. In what period are they deemed to be worthless? Now we're going to talk toward the very end of this video about all the different things that have to be met before it can be deemed to be worthless. So we'll come back to that. The next bullet point deals with the recoveries. In some cases, an amount previously written off as a bad debt and allocated to the program may be recovered in a subsequent accounting period. In such cases, the income therefrom must be used to reduce the cost of the beneficiary services for the period in which collection is made. So even though they refer to cost here, we know that bad debt is paid in a separate manner. But the key point is the last section of this. It's, it's reducing that cost, or really it's reducing bad debts for the period in which collection is made. So if you have a bad debt that was written off in 2019, but then surprisingly it's, it's uh, recovered in 2020, you would have that negative bad debt, that recovery, offsetting 2020's bad debts. You're not going to go back and try to correct 2019. You're going to correct it and offset it in the period in which the recovery and the collection was actually made. So again, the key word is timing. Or the key concept is timing. So now let's dig into non-allowable bad debts. There are three main types of bad debts that we will not be able to allow. Any services reimbursed under a fee schedule are not allowed. And this goes back to 42 CFR 41389I. Now, as far as how do you know if a service was fee schedule, when you're ordering up the PSNR to report the services on your cost report, any PSNR report ending in a 5 is a fee schedule report. So when the auditors are reviewing your bad debt listing, one of the first things we're going to be doing is verifying that that claim existed in a PSNR in a, in a valid report. If we find that in a fee schedule report, right off the bat, that's not going to be allowable bad debt. So just keep that in mind. The next bullet point deals with the HMO, Medicare Part C, Managed Care, Medicare Plus Choice. It's had a variety of names over the years, but basically it's a, it's a HMO plan. And if this patient was covered under the Medicare Part C versus Part A or Part B, that's not going to be reimbursable on the Medicare cost report. Now, as far as the policy to point to, there is, I, you see this link here, there's an article on the website, it's basically a managed care plan policy, and there's a quote from that, and I've underlined the important point that Medicare will not reimburse providers for bad debt payments incurred by MA or Medicare Advantage plan members. In other words, the MA plan can decide to reimburse their members for their own bad debts, but Medicare, on the cost report, 
is not going to reimburse providers for HMO bad debts. So that's another thing we're going to take a look at. And again, if you can't find it on one of the normal PSNR reports, and just as a side note, report type 118 is the HMO report. So any claim that is found on 118 is an HMO claim, and it will not be allowed for Medicare bad debt reimbursement. The third type of bad debt that's not going to be allowed is the professional component of a provider-based physician's remuneration. Now, again, this is a fee schedule item, which, as we said first, was not allowable. But there's a specific policy reference that details this as well. CMS Publication 15-1, Section 324, also explicitly calls this type of bad debt out as one that will not be reimbursable. So let's move on now and talk about the policy, the CMS policy manual behind this that implements the regulations. So specifically, you'll find this under CMS Pub 15-1, Chapter 3. Now, there are a variety of sections. We're going to talk about a few of them. The first thing I wanted to mention was the Section 310, which details what the reasonable collection effort requirements are. And we have this broken into three basic things. First of all, similar collection effort. We're going to see each of these in more detail. Number two, timely billing. And number three, a genuine and not a token collection effort. The next thing I want to mention is that the exceptions to reasonable collection efforts are defined further at Section 312. So first of all, let's look into the similar collection effort. What are we talking about there? The similar collection effort basically says that the collection effort you put forth for collecting a Medicare bad debt should be the same as the collection effort you put forth for collecting a non-Medicare bad debt. Now, obviously, there's an incentive, there's more of an incentive to collect the non-Medicare bad debt, and that incentive is that there's nobody else that's going to reimburse you for that amount, so either you collect it from the patient or you do not collect it at all. For Medicare, yes, there's a Medicare payment. Medicare will kick in at least a partial payment, the 65%. But the point is, you should still be trying to collect it just as hard as you were trying to collect a non-Medicare bad debt before coming back to try to get reimbursement from the Medicare program. Now, the similar collection effort. Again, we're saying between Medicare and non-Medicare for the same dollar classes of bad debts. Now, this doesn't mean you're going to treat a $50 Medicare bad debt the same way that you treat a $5,000 non-Medicare bad debt. Certainly, there are going to be differences in how you treat different dollar classes of bad debts, and that's fine as long as the way you treat, let's say, a $100 Medicare bad debt is the same as how you treat a $100 non-Medicare bad debt. They have to be the same for that class of bad debt. Now, there should be similar handling for the collection agency. If you send a non-Medicare bad debt of $300 off to a collection agency, you should send the Medicare bad debt of $300 off to the collection agency as well. There should also be a consistent write-off policy. So in your bad debt policy internally, they should be treated the same. There should be no major distinctions between the two. Now, as auditors, when we are testing for this, we're obviously going to have to collect a sample of the non-Medicare bad debts to determine how they were written off compared to how the Medicare bad debts were written off. So that might be the one situation where we'll be requiring documentation for a non-Medicare patient. The next issue that comes up is timely billing. And here we point to CMS publication 15-1, section 310. And the collection effort must involve the issuance of a bill on or shortly after discharge or death of the beneficiary to the party responsible for the patient's personal financial obligations. So that's the requirement, on or shortly after discharge. Now, it's reasonable to wait for a Medicare RA before billing the patient, because without that Medicare RA, 
you're only estimating what the coinsurance and deductible amounts are going to be. So you're trying to determine what the pre precise amount is that that patient will owe. So it's reasonable to wait for the Medicare RA before billing, but it's not reasonable to wait much longer than that. We would expect the bill to be issued very shortly after the Medicare RA is received. Now, in some cases, there may be other payers that are involved. You may not know fully what other payers are involved or whether they're liable or not. In this situation, to be a timely bill, you should be issuing the bill after you receive the Medicare RA, even if you believe there might be a revision down the road to some other payers, due to some other payers. That's fine, but we would expect a bill to be issued very shortly after the Medicare RA receipt. If we as auditors see a major delay that appears to be unreasonable, first of all, the concern is that if you wait too long to bill a patient, they possibly may not believe there's any importance in that bill because why did the hospital wait so long? They, it may not be at the top of their mind what that bill was related to because again, so much time has passed since the patient was in the hospital, they may not, they may question whether it's a legitimate bill. Maybe they were able to pay at the time of the stay, and now they're not able to pay. There could be changes in the financial condition. So just for a variety of reasons, this timely bill is required. If the delay is unreasonable when we first look at it, it will require documentation if the provider believes that it should be considered reasonable. Again, they're going to have to submit documentation to support that. If there's no satisfactory documentation, documentation that is produced, the bad debt will be permanently disallowed. And what we mean by that, permanently disallowed, is that if you violate the timely billing principle, then that bad debt is tainted. That particular account is permanently tainted and there's no way to just write it off later or revise the write-off or send a bill now. There's nothing you can do to correct that situation. If the bill wasn't sent out timely, it's tainted. The next section we'll spend some time talking about is the requirement that the collection effort be genuine and not token. So when we're reviewing this, one of the first things we're going to be asking for is a written collection policy. In other words, what do you as a provider, what activities do you normally go through when you're collecting a bad debt, writing it off, all of that? We're going to compare that with the evidence of your actual practice to identify, first of all, are you following the policy? And second, does it appear to be a genuine collection effort? One aspect of the genuine collection effort is whether you first of all issued the bill timely and have you continued to try to collect in reasonable increments after that first bill. For example, maybe you send a bill monthly. So those would be considered reasonable and customary attempts. They may include phone calls. Hopefully they include language that is a little bit more stringent each time indicating, hey, this is the second attempt, third attempt, final attempt, we really need to collect this bill. Now, Section 310.2 comes into play here, and it's considered the presumption of non-collectability, sometimes referred to as the 120-day rule. Now, what this basically says is, if after reasonable and customary attempts to collect a bill, the debt remains unpaid more than 120 days from the date the first bill is mailed to the beneficiary, the debt may be deemed uncollectible. So what this means is you have to try with reasonable effort to collect the bad debt, but if 120 days have passed and all of your telephone calls, all of your mailings, all of that was unsuccessful, then at that point you can reasonably deem it to be uncollectible. What this does not mean is that, hey, just issue a bill and then wait 120 days and write it off. It does not mean that by any means. Simply waiting 120 days won't guarantee acceptance if you did not expend reasonable collection effort up to that point.
Now, the other thing, however, it does not mean that you absolutely must wait 120 days before writing a bad debt off. There might be situations where the bad debt it can be written off prior to 120 days if you have documentation to support a reasonable exception. One example that comes up from time to time is when the patient is deceased and the facility knows it, the hospital is aware of it, they check for an estate, they check to probate to see if there is any sort of other person liable, is there any family member liable for this patient, do they have an estate. If they're able to obtain that documentation within less than 120 days, that documentation may very well support that writing it off in 30, 60, 90 days, whatever it might be, is reasonable. The key thing is documentation there. And again, the deceased patient with the estate check or the probate check is a common example that would come up. But again, just saying it's a deceased patient would not be enough. You do have to document that you've checked for an estate or some other liable family member. So continuing on with the genuine collection effort, if we go into Section 310B, it says the provider's collection effort may be documented in the patient's file by copies of the bills, follow-up letters, reports of telephone or personal contact, etc. So a couple of things that come into play here. First of all, the documentation should be contemporaneous with the activity. If you're sending the bill out in a certain time period, that should be available. That copy should be available. It's not something you should be creating later on trying to replicate it. It needs to be in existence. You should keep a copy, whether it's electronic or whatever, that should be available for audit. The other thing is that there should be a difference in the language in subsequent billings, as I mentioned earlier. It should be an increasing collection effort. The phone call should be spread out over a reasonable time period. You shouldn't just be sending one letter, making a series of phone calls over one week and calling it good. They should be spread out over a reasonable time period. And that's really where that 120 days comes into play. That should be a reasonable time period to spread your collection effort across to try to attempt to collect this debt. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention with this genuine collection effort is the use of collection agencies. Now, I have one of our website links here. Obviously, with this video, you won't be able to click on that, but at least you can see where it is. You can search our WPSGHA website for bad debt collection agencies, and this will come up as well. Or you can just type in this uh, link as well. But if we go back to Section 310B for these collection agencies, it says here a provider's collection effort may include the use of a collection agency in addition to the subsequent billings, all of that. Where a collection agency is used, Medicare expects the provider to refer all uncollected patient charges of like amount to the agency without regard to class of patient. By class, we're talking about Medicare or private pay. There should be no regard to whether it's a Medicare or non-Medicare bad debt. It's the dollar amount that can determine whether to go to the collection agency. So if a provider refers to a collection agency, it's non-collected, non-Medicare patient charges, which in amount are comparable to the individual Medicare deductible and coinsurance amounts. Medicare requires the provider to also refer its uncollected Medicare deductible and coinsurance amounts. That we will talk about one more thing related to the collection agency later on, and it deals with the timing of bad debts the bad debt write-off. But before we do that, let's talk about the dual eligible patients. These are patients that are both Medicaid and Medicare eligible. So the question here is what collection effort is required when it's a Medicaid patient. So this is where the must bill policy kicks in. This is the informal name for requirement that has been a CMS directive since 2004. It's been successfully defended in several court cases. 
and it stems from the requirement in Section 312 that the provider must determine that no source other than the patient would be legally responsible for the patient's medical bill, and it gives the example of Title 19 or local welfare agencies and guardians. So Section 312, we're going to see, uh, deals with the, the indigence exception. So basically, 312 is an exception to your normal collection effort of Section 310. However, in order to fall under Section 312, you must determine that Title 19 is not legally responsible. The must-bill policy essentially states that the only way to determine if Title 19 or the state Medicaid program is liable is to bill them. So the must-bill policy to support a Medicaid bad debt, you must bill the state and you must receive a Medicaid RA to document whether they paid, whether they denied the claim, whatever the case may be, before this is going to be allowable as a Medicare bad debt. Now, a couple of other things that come up with that is that the amounts in the bill must be the same as the amount you're trying to report as bad debt. In other words, whatever the coinsurance and deductible for that claim was, you must bill for the entire amount, and then whatever portion Medicaid does not pay is the maximum amount that you would be allowable for the bad debt under Medicare. The documentation on the Medicaid RA must clearly show the amount of payment or a valid denial code. So the other aspect of the must-bill policy in the dual eligible patients is whether or not there should be collection effort against the patient themselves. So there's going to be collection effort against the Medicaid state Title 19 program. However, the patient, that's the question here. So generally speaking, Medicaid programs have what's known as a share of cost. There are a variety of terms for it, but they have a specific amount that they expect the patient to pay and Medicaid will pay the rest of it. Now, there is the exception with something known as a Qualified Medicare Beneficiary, a QMB. That's an exception, and as we'll see here, there should be no collection effort against a QMB in any case. However, for non-QMB patients that are just Medicaid, Medicaid and Medicare, but they're not the QMB status, we would expect the traditional collection effort against that beneficiary for that Medicaid share of cost. In other words, if they did not pay that Medicaid share of cost, then that particular portion would not be allowed unless there was collection effort against it as a regular bad debt. Now, the other situation that might come up with Medicaid is where the provider themselves has, not, has chosen to not enroll in that Medicaid program for that state, and in this case, they cannot accept a patient as Medicaid, and they cannot bill for Medicaid patients. Now, in that situation, the provider is required to notify the patients of that situation and the fact that they are being admitted as a private pay individual. So they can either accept the patient as private pay, or they could accept them understanding that they're Medicaid patient knowing full well that they will not be able to receive reimbursement because they cannot bill the Medicaid agency. In these situations, the traditional collection effort would be required, and we would not allow the use of the patient's Medicaid status to waive the collection effort. In other words, the Medicaid status in that particular scenario would not be usable to define that as an indigent patient to exempt them from collection effort of Section 310. Now let's move on to Section 312, which is the indigent exception to collection effort. Again, I have a link to our website for this. There are three issues I wanted to talk about with indigents. The first one is that indigence is not the same as charity. I know the two terms are often used interchangeably, but that, that distinction between the two terms is even more important now because we have worksheet S-10 dish uncompensated care payment audits 
where there is a very clear distinction between a bad debt and a charity care item. In fact, if we move to CMS Publication 15-2, Section 4012, we find that for Medicare purposes, charity care is not reimbursable, and unpaid amounts associated with charity care are not considered as an allowable Medicare bad debt. So again, if we see a listing that shows charity care, even if you may have deter intended that to be indigent bad debts, there's going to be a concern that that's being duplicated. So be very careful labeling your bad debts, your indigent bad debts. Do not use the term charity care because charity care, again, will be reported elsewhere altogether. Issue number two with indigence is the timing of that indigence determination. Section 310 of the policy discusses how, in some cases, the provider may have established before discharge or within a reasonable time before the current admission that the beneficiary is either indigent or medically indigent. So what I want to mention here, before discharge. So what this basically means is you've, you're going through the paperwork, the patient is still in the hospital, and before they're discharged, you realize that this patient meets our indigence criteria, so we are going to set them up as an indigent patient, and we're not going to perform collection effort against that patient for that reason. It's going to be a bad debt right off the bat. So before discharge, before that current discharge, or within a reasonable time before the current admission. In other words, let's say the patient just recently had a stay a month or two ago. And during that discharge, before that discharge they were deemed to be indigent, it might be reasonable to believe that that same indigence determination can be used for this current admission. So we don't have to necessarily redo the documentation every single stay as long as a reasonable time, only a reasonable time has passed. But what this does not allow in the face of it is an indigence determination after discharge. So that's just something to keep in mind here. The policy only really gives two options. So just be careful with when that indigence determination is made. The other thing I want to mention with that is if there is a lengthy period of time before that indigence determination is made, we would expect reasonable collection effort as if this were a non-indigent patient. So if, if the provider did not bill the patient at all, and then they try to come back 120, 150, whatever days later and say, yeah, we've deemed it to be an indigent patient, that would not be allowable because a first bill should have been issued, reasonable collection effort should have been issued, or the indigent determination should have been made in a timely manner. Issue number three is the provider-determined indigence, which uh, brings us to the discussion of the terms must versus should. So from indigence, by the way, we have two basic ways that a patient can be determined indigent. If they are Medicaid, if they're a Medicaid-eligible patient, that in and of itself can be used to deem them indigent. Now, if it is not a Medicaid-eligible patient, it's up to the provider to determine the indigence. Now, this cannot be made by the patient themselves. They can't declare themselves indigent. It's the provider that has to go through their normal process, and they must take into account a patient's total resources, analyzing the assets, and just certain assets, liabilities, income, and expenses. So they should take that into account, and if they don't take that into account, all four of those items, we are not going to be able to allow that as a bad debt. So that is a requirement of the policy. All four of these items must be considered when making an indigence determination. Now that brings us to a few important notes. Something known as presumptive indigence is not allowable for bad debts. In other words, you cannot rely on some third party's analysis. You can't rely on a credit score rating. Uh, 
it has to be a review of assets, liabilities, revenues, and expenses, and it must be done by the provider. So we cannot allow presumptive indigence for bad debts. Another thing, a deceased beneficiary, sometimes these come in on indigent lists, but a deceased beneficiary cannot automatically be deemed indigent. As we said earlier, when there is a deceased patient, a deceased beneficiary, their account would have to be analyzed and you'd have to review to see if there was an estate that would be liable for that amount or if there's a family member liable. You'd have to review that and provide documentation for that. It would not generally fall under an indigence determination. The other one I wanted to mention here is maybe less obvious. This is with a bankrupt provider. Although it seems at first glance that a bankrupt provider would inherently be indigent, in that situation we would need documentation that you filed a claim with the bankruptcy courts where applicable. Now again, the key thing there is that if they're in bankruptcy, there is a chance that you'll be able to retrieve some of that money through the bankruptcy filing. So we need to make sure you've gone through that process for that. If it is still claimed indigent at the time, after they've declared bankruptcy, it must be based on the provider's review of the financial status at the time, not just solely the fact that they filed for bankruptcy. Again, patient deemed or provider deemed indigents must be documented by a review of all four of those items, assets, liabilities, revenues, and expenses. So the next topic we'll talk about is that of the write-off requirements. And here we move to CMS Publication 15-1, Section 314. Again, I have a link to our website that deals with some more of these topics. For this one, I want to read through this quotation, at least some of it. Uncollectible deductibles and coinsurance amounts are recognized as allowable bad debts in the reporting period in which the debts are deemed to be worthless. I've bolded this next section. Allowable bad debts must be related to specific amounts which have been determined to be uncollectible. Since bad debts are uncollectible accounts receivables, the provider should have the usual accounts receivable records, ledger cards, and source documents to support its claim for a bad debt for each account included. So what this means, as we talked about early on, is that there might be two different entries related to a bad debt, the second being the actual write-off, that is the point in which the account was truly written off to a patient's account. That's what we're looking for. That's the timing. That's also the documentation we need to see. Again, this is detailed more in our article. If we continue on to Section 413.89, we deal with the collection agency requirements, and in this situation, we have a few different uh, elements related to collection agencies. I detail these in our website that's linked here, but the key thing we're pointing to is that there's no likelihood of recovery of the debt at any time in the future. If the account is still with the collection agency, that implies that somebody's sound reasonable judgment, sound business judgment, has determined there may be a likelihood of recovery. So Medicare and CMS requires that the bad debt must be completely returned from the collection agency before it's eligible to be written off as a bad debt on the Medicare cost report. So the way to summarize this after everything we've gone through is that a bad debt can only be written off for Medicare purposes on the cost report after all of the below criteria have been met. First of all, proper collection effort had to have been met or an indigence determination was properly made. Second, if it's a dual eligible bad debt, a Medicaid RA must have been received from the state. Third, if this bad debt was sent to the collection agency, it must be returned from the collection agency. Fourth, any internal collection effort that was ongoing must have ceased before this can be considered a bad debt that's been written off. And last, the account has actually been written off formally 
in your internal accounting records. So we talked about the journal entries early on, but what this means is the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger for that patient has to have included a write-off for that amount. So whatever date that write-off is recorded, that's the date we're going to allow this bad debt to be considered as a Medicare bad debt. Really, what it boils down to is it's the later of all five of these items. Now, again, whatever cost reporting period that date, that latest date happens to fall into, is when this is going to be allowable uh, in the cost report. However, there are some exceptions. There's one exception that if you go to CMS Publication 15 1, Section 2176, this says that when a provider terminates its participation in the program or a change of ownership occurs, a chow. But notice it says, see Health Insurance Regulations Section 405.626. Then it continues on and says, bad debts resulting from coinsurance and deductibles billed to Medicare patients are allowable in the final cost report. So what this basically means is you no longer have to wait until it is actually written off and reported in that cost reporting period of write-off. This would allow you to report it in the final cost reporting period. So from a change of ownership perspective, what some providers have thought is that this allows them that if they're the old owner, they have a bad debt, and it was it occurred the the dates of service occurred during their cost reporting period their last cost reporting period but then the actual write off of the bad debt for example waiting 120 days did not happen until the first cost reporting period of the new owner what they're thinking is that based on this section they can bring that bad debt back into their final cost report instead of it being written off in the normal period of, of write-off. The problem with this is that this section refers to a regulation section 405.626 that actually hasn't been around since 1979. That regulation no longer exists. That particular section has been changed. This old regulation, if you look at the 1978 CFR, it refers to a situation when all changes of ownerships were considered to be full terminations. In other words, there would be a new provider agreement, new provider number, and in that situation, that exception holds true because the new owner has nothing to do with the old owner. It's a different agreement. Everything is different. So what I'm saying is this provision of 2176 only applies in situations where there is a full termination of the provider agreement and that can be found when a new number is issued to the new owner. In that situation, 2176 kicks in, but if it's a regular change of ownership where the new owner is accepting the old owner's number and provider agreement, in that situation, the traditional rule for writing off a bad debt applies and that means that that bad debt cannot be reported in any cost reporting period until all the criteria are met. And in that period when the criteria are met, that's the cost reporting period it gets reported in. So in that situation I mentioned earlier, you would have the bad debts of an old owner that are written off after the change of ownership, and they would be reported in the new owner's cost report. So now we'll talk about another topic that actually happens after the bad debt write-off. This is the topic of recoveries. So one of the requirements we said earlier is that there's no likelihood of recovery at any time in the future. That was one of the criteria before we could even write a bad debt off to begin with. However, that sound business judgment isn't always perfect. And this is the same in financial accounting as well. You write an account off, you've waited 120 or more days, and you believe it to be futile to collect, to expend any further collection effort. So you've written the account off, and then surprisingly, 
maybe a few months later, maybe a few years later, the patient comes in to pay their account and you have a recovery. So this bad debt in an extreme situation could have possibly been written five years ago, written off five years ago. So now you have a recovery now and it's too late to reopen a cost report five years ago to net the two together. So that's one of the reasons for this requirement, as well as just the administrative burden of reopening something that far back. So for this reason, it's an exception to your normal matching of recoveries with previous bad debt write-offs. We're not concerned with that. Instead, we will report the recovery, in other words, the negative bad debt, in the period of recovery. So if a bad debt from 2015, it was written off in 2015, now it's recovered in 2020, that negative bad debt, that recovery is going to be offsetting bad debts from 2020. One additional topic I wanted to mention here was that of bad debts and their relation to Worksheet S10, the uncompensated care. So here we have Worksheet S-10, line 26. This reports total bad debts. This is an element that is under review for any provider that is selected for an S-10 uncompensated care audit. We look at total bad debts, which basically means Medicare and non-Medicare. Those are part of uncompensated care. In other words, if no party has reimbursed you for that amount, it's uncompensated. Now, remember, however, that for a Medicare bad debt, assuming it met all the criteria for allowability, Medicare is indeed paying 65%. So it's actually the other 35% that was not reimbursed by the Medicare program that is carried over as uncompensated care. But again, I want to stress something from earlier. Bad debt, even indigent bad debt, is not the same as charity care. On Worksheet S-10, charity care is up on line 20. The bad debt is on line 26. These are two distinct issues and should be reported separately. The final thing I wanted to bring up is a new bad debt template that is available and a new requirement more specifically. The requirement is that for cost reporting periods beginning on or after 10 118 Documentation must be submitted that supports the bad debts in, in a way that corresponds to what is reported on the cost report. In other words, if you've reported $115,760 of bad debts on the cost report, you need to have a listing that shows that exact amount. It needs to correspond to what you've reported. In the past, the requirement has just been that you have the exhibit it used to be the Exhibit 5, then it was the Exhibit 2 that just showed the listing of bad debts. There was not an explicit requirement that the amounts tie out. Now there is. So currently, Exhibit 2 of the Worksheet S-2 Part 2 Hospital Reimbursement Questionnaire is what's used. There is a document, a template, that can be used now and in the future it is currently just optional to use this specific document, but at some point in the future, it may become required. So we've made it available at this point. It's an Excel spreadsheet. It should be helpful to document all the different types of bad debts you have. It'll create a nice summary. It'll show you what information is needed during the time of audit. It's kind of the key thing there. So I have two different websites, and again, they're pretty lengthy websites. The first one is the cost report documentation requirements templates link. If you go to this first website, you'll see a link to this other one, which is the actual template itself. So I wanted to point out what this template looks like. Now this is discussed in further detail. In that main website that I mentioned, we actually have a separate YouTube video that goes through all of this. But I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Right off the bat, when it opens up, there's an instruction tab, first of all. 
and there's a bad debt summary tab that it it lists out or it will list out the bad debt for each of your different potential types of bad debts these link to another worksheet in this workbook and the way to open that worksheet is to come over here to the type of bad debt you're looking for and just put an X in there. Notice that X opens up the acute care inpatient traditional listing. The other thing you should do is type in the provider number for that particular unit or that hospital so we know what it relates to. When you open up this tab, all that information, the year, the provider number, that will flow over here and it will give you a place to report all of your bad debts. This line 11 will always be the total, so it adds from below. Usually a total is at the end. This one is at the beginning so that you can use as many rows as you need without impacting that formula. So when you enter the amounts down here, again, the patient last name, first name, the MBI number, all the information that you see here, it will sum up in the total at, on, in row 11, which will then carry over to the summary tab for you. So a couple of things I wanted to point out that relate to the training we've had tonight. We talked about the dates. So we talked about the internal accounts receivable write-off the date the account was returned from the collection agency, the date all internal collection efforts ceased, and we have the Medicaid RA date back here a bit. The Medicare write-off date is the latest of columns 14, 15, and 16. In other words, it's what was the latest date? Have you, have you done everything you need to do before you can write it off for Medicare purposes? This is the date we're going to be looking for to make sure it falls within your cost reporting period. It allows for recoveries to be reported. It also allows for the labeling of patient responsibility. Maybe it's an indigent share. Maybe you've deemed the patient to be indigent and you've given them a 75% reduction because of that, but the other 25% they owe. You can report the Medicaid share of cost, or if it's a QMB patient, then label QMB. In insert the QMB label here, and then we would know that there should be no patient collection effort. In the far right, I wanted to mention there are some informational-only columns. This, These are just flags for you to consider when you're entering your data. This might show a situation where this bill may potentially be untimely. There's a lengthy time that's passed since the Medicare RA. You might want to make sure you have documentation for it. There's a potential 120-day rule violation, but again, you need to have documentation for that. What day should you report the bad debt? Is that day within the current cost reporting period? So that'll give you a flag if it's not. And do your allowable bad debts, do they equal or are they equal to or less than the total Medicare deductible and coinsurance minus any current year payments that were already made for that patient? So again, the instructions go through all of that, but I just wanted to point out a few key things there. So hopefully that is uh, useful for you. It'll summarize everything. It's certainly going to be useful for us at the point of audit. This may very well be required in the future, but at this point it is just optional. We've made it available on our website. So I thank you for your time in this video going through the bad debt requirements. If you do have any questions, please send them on to us and we will be glad to help out. Thank you again, and I will talk to you in our next video.